The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Joanna Nelson. And I'm with the New Mexico Economic Development Department. Thank you so much for joining us today for this important webinar. We are really honored to host our good partner, the New Mexico Finance Authority, to discuss their... Hopefully, you received notice that we had such a high volume of attendees and registration that the platform we are using can only support a certain amount. So we are live streaming this through Facebook and YouTube. If you are having any difficulty accessing 
the webinar through GoToWebinar, please feel free to access our New Mexico Economic Development channel and you can see the webinar live. I will mention that this broadcast is being recorded. We will send out the link to every person that registered to uh, be able to view this post presentation. And you also will receive the slides in a PDF form. So again, thank you very much. We did receive your questions and we have passed those questions on to the New Mexico Finance Authority and we'll do our best during the presentation to answer those questions as well. I did want to provide a bit of information about the New Mexico Economic Development Department briefly. Our cabinet secretary is Alicia J. Keyes. Our deputy cabinet secretary is John Clark. You can see that our department covers several different divisions. I wanted to highlight a few upcoming events and sessions that we have with the Economic Development Department. We have been conducting a series of webinars to provide information and awareness around financial opportunities for businesses that have been negatively impacted by COVID-19. Two of the um, uh, webinars that we have coming up. One is focused on business owners of color going over business resources. That will happen December 11th. We also have a business finance fair that will focus on the southwestern portion of the state. This is an opportunity for businesses in the southwestern region to hear directly from financing programs, whether they are lenders, nonprofits, CDFIs, etc. They'll hear from them directly and get contact information and information about their programs. That will be happening, happening virtually, and that will be on December 9th. You can register online. The next one will focus on the southeastern part of the state, and hopefully that will be sometime in January or February. Our quarter four funded meeting is coming up next week. That'll be the last one of the year. You can still apply, and that application is available online. We also are currently involved with our Rural Efficient Business Program. This is a, an initiative that we are working on in partnership with NMSU, as well as the Manufacturing Extension Partnership to assist businesses in rural areas to address their energy consumption, and look at ways of how they can decrease their energy usage and become more efficient so they can save money, and also look at if it makes sense to utilize renewable sources of energy, businesses in rural areas are able to sign up for a no cost energy assessment to see how and where they could save money by decreasing energy usage. All information is available at this link. And one more plug, uh, our collateral assistance program is currently open. This is our program that enables us to assist with businesses that have business projects that are seeking a commercial loan that have a shortfall in collateral or a deficiency. We have a program that enables us to purchase a CD in a bank to fulfill that gap in collateral. And an example would be a restaurant is seeking a piece of equipment, $100,000. The, the lender is only looking to um, recognize 75% of the value. There's a gap of 25,000. And so we can purchase a CD and um, make up the difference. And if the loan defaults, then the lender is able to utilize our CD. So if you have any questions about any of these events or programs, please get in touch with us. I also wanted to point out that our um, economic development department has regional reps in all regions of the state. If you are not familiar with your regional rep, you can see their contact information is here. They are a fantastic resource and are able to talk to you about your needs and your projects and connect you to the right resources. And with this link, you can find all of the information. Here is our contact information. 
I also want to point out that during the pandemic, we are providing a newsletter every Friday that highlights any updates around COVID-19 relief programs, as well as additional business and community resources. We're also providing information about webinars occurring and news, uh, important news around uh, the pandemic. So if you are not getting our, our news updates or our emails and you would like to, this is the link to sign up for that. Our website can be seen here, goandm.biz. Uh, we are going to post this presentation on our YouTube channel. You can also find a wide variety of previous presentations about numerous topics and financing opportunities uh, from around the state on our YouTube channel. We also have an Opportunity Zones website you can see here. And another valuable resource for businesses during this time is the New Mexico Small Business Development Center. And the link is provided here. And uh, my contact is here as well as Mark Roper, the Division Director of the Economic Development Department. Thank you again for tuning in and please reach out if we can be of any assistance. Without further ado, I would like to introduce the CEO of New Mexico Finance Authority, Marquita Russell, to talk about the program that they are helping to manage. Thank you, Joanna, and I appreciate everyone attending today. I am going to endeavor to show, well, let me show the right screen here. Um, there we go. Do I have it? Wonderful. That was a yes? Okay. Um, so I, uh, I'm here today to talk about the Small Business Cares Relief Grants. I appreciate you all tuning in. This is a brand new program, and uh, we are happy to be sharing the, um, the, the basics of this program today. But first, a little bit about the Finance Authority. Uh, the New Mexico Finance Authority was created in 1992. Our purpose is to provide low-cost financing, primarily for cities and counties, but also businesses and nonprofits throughout New Mexico. Our mission is to advance uh, New Mexico by financing impactful, well-planned projects. And we would note here that impactful doesn't necessarily mean big. It just means important and important to the community or to the business. Um, we think that our operation of this program falls very much in line uh, with our mission. As part of the first special session back in June, our agency was named as the administrator of the $400 million small business recovery loans. This is a program that provides very beneficial low-cost loans of up to $75,000 to small businesses that experienced significant revenue declines in April and May. It's a three-year loan program, interest only. Um, very low cost. I've put on here our uh, website information because that app, that program actually um, goes, uh, we can only accept applications through December 31st. So we want to make sure you have information on that program as well. We understand that all sources of funding may be necessary during these difficult times. So nmfinance.com and you'll see uh, a link for uh, the Small Business Recovery Loan Fund. So I'll just make a note there that that's something, if you haven't looked into it, you probably it's probably worth a minute or two to do so. Um, I'm here today, though, to talk about the Small Business Cares Relief Grants. And this was something that was done last week as part of the, special, the second special session of the legislature. Um, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham and the legislature directed $100 million of the federal stimulus funds, those are those care funds, um, they directed them to the Finance Authority to operate a grant program for small businesses hit very hard by the pandemic. We have to have these funds distributed by December 28th. So we are on a fast track to get as much money as we can into, small, into the hands of small businesses. Um, under the program rules, um, the legislation says that we can provide grants of up to $50,000 to businesses with 100 or fewer employees that are experiencing financial hardship. Our application process will open next week on uh, beginning at noon on Monday, December 7th, and will run through noon on Friday, December 18th. So it's a short time frame, um, just 11 days, uh, but that's 
So that's why we're here telling you today about what you need to do to prepare yourself for that program. A couple of things that the legislation also requires. Uh, the first is that it requires that NMFA ensure that these grant dollars get um, a, a nice geographic dispersion across the state. For us to meet that goal, we've set aside 40% of the funds uh, for businesses in rural areas. And um, the other 60% is then available to businesses that are in what we'll call urban areas, uh, which we have defined as cities that have a population of 50,000 uh, 50, people and those um, adjacent communities, those within 10 miles of the city limits for those four communities. And those would be Albuquerque, Las Cruces, Rio Rancho, and Santa Fe. So if you're within a 10 mile radius of those um, of those four cities, then you would be included in the urban group, which has a 60% set aside for you. Um, the legislation also requires that we give priority to businesses in the hospitality and leisure industries. And we've using a similar method of setting aside funds to make certain that those businesses have access to the dollars. So we're putting aside 20% of the funds for accommodation businesses. Those are um, lodging, uh, uh, hotels, motels, beds and breakfasts, that sort of thing. There's 20% of the funding be be being set aside for food services and drinking businesses, um, restaurants, bars, that sort of thing. 15% for all other leisure businesses. And there's a specific industry code called Arts, Entertainment, Recreation. So it'll be those that start with Industry Code 71. Um, we're also setting aside 3% of the money for destination marketing organizations. And those are those primarily nonprofits that are responsible for getting tourism tourists into uh, New Mexico, getting outside dollars into the state. Many of those are funded from lodgers tax, which is you know, charged on hotel visitations. And since that's been down, these particular businesses have been very um, hit. They've been hit very hard. And we need to get money into those organizations so that they can work to bring tourists in to help all the rest of New Mexico businesses. So 3% of the money is being set aside for those. And then lastly, 2% is being set aside for non-employer businesses. So those are primarily self-employed folks, but also real estate holding companies or others that um, don't have employees but uh, do perform a, do have a business and perform a business function. Um, lastly, the legislation requires that NMFA give priority to businesses that are experiencing severe economic impact and hardship. So we'll be determining that by taking um, each applicant's profit and loss for the period of April 1 through November 30, and dividing by the number of employees. And we're going to use this calculation to prioritize applications in the event that the amount of applications exceeds the amount of funding we have available. So if, if we don't get enough applications for the $100 million, then we wouldn't be using this calculation. But we highly expect that we're going to receive um, enough applications to fulfill that 100 million or more. And so we anticipate that this calculation will come into play. Um, all told, with that geographic dispersion and industry diver uh, dispersions, this is how the money comes out. Um, a total of 20% for hospitality. And you'll see again, um, that means 12 million will go to hospitality groups in urban areas and 8 million in rural, similarly for restaurants and bars. Our destination marketing organizations are going to get uh, 1.8 million is set aside for those organizations in urban areas and uh, 1.2 million in rural hospitality and other hospitality and leisure, 9 million for urban, 6 million for rural, and then all other employer based businesses, $24 million of grants will be made available for businesses in urban areas and 16 uh, million for businesses in rural areas. Grants themselves will actually be awarded based on the size of uh, the business as it relates to their employees. So if you have no business, no employees, again, you would be a non-employer business, you are eligible to receive $2,000. That's a flat $2,000. 
Um, if you have one to five employees, you would receive $10,000. Six to 15, you'd receive a flat amount of $15,000. 16 to 25 employees, you'll receive $25,000. 26 to 40, 30,000. 41 to 60, $40,000. 61 to 75, 45,000. And then maxing out uh, from 76 employees up to the 100, which is the max set out in statute, you'll receive the max um, allowed in the statute, which is $50,000. We'd note that contract employees are not counted in this calculation, um, but part time employees are. So this is not an equivalency. These are actual people being employed. Um, and we're going to uh, ask you for the number of employees that you have. And then we're going to look to um, a quarterly report from the Department of Workforce Solutions that you provide us as part of your application to evidence that number. Uh, but we understand that given the times that, that they are, that applicants may have had to downsize their employees um, because they simply don't have the business revenue to support them. Um, so we're able to um, allow uh, businesses to go back and use pre-COVID employment levels. So anytime in 2019, any single month there um, in order to have you maximize the benefit under the program. So if you are a seasonal business, let's say you're a bar or a restaurant whose really busy time is, starts in April and goes through the end of the summer, obviously you wouldn't have the ability to demonstrate that this year because you've not been able to be open. So going back to you know those periods of time last year in 2019 would be, be beneficial for you. So you choose the month, you submit to us the quarterly report, wage report that you provide to the Department of Workforce Solutions to evidence that that's in fact the number of people that you were reporting wages on. So that quarterly report for January, February, or March would be reported on March 31st of 2019. And then the last quarterly report would be that one of uh, September 30th of 2020. So you have the flexibility to select the month within that time frame that allows you to maximize uh, the benefits based on the uh, sliding scale that we have here of employees. I would note that if you're a large business and in regular times employ more than 100 people, but you've had to downsize again, this would be the other ways that you could do it. So you can choose your largest number or your smallest number in order to help you uh, maximize this grant. We are um, not going to be processing applications on a first come first serve basis. It's We think it's important to give um, businesses as much time as possible to put together good applications, to make certain they understand about the program and understand what's needed to apply. Um, but we also don't want this money to be sitting in our bank accounts when it is really better suited for your bank accounts. So we'll be opening the application again from Monday, um, December 7th, through Friday, December 18th, and you can apply at any time in that period. Um, and we'll make certain that there are funds available till the end, but we're going to um, process these applications basically in three rounds. So we'll put 40 million of the monies that are available immediately into play um, uh, in that first week. So on noon, on December 10th, which would be that Thursday, we're gonna take all applications that have been provided to that date and prioritize them in the event that there's more in requests than we have in money. So if we have $50 million of requests, we'll obviously have to prioritize because we're only making available $40 million in that first round. So we'll prioritize them and then we will make awards. Um, applicants that may have applied but were not successful in that round will be moved over into the next round for consideration. You do not apply twice. You apply just the one time. Um, so then round two, we'll do a similar thing. Um, on Tuesday the 15th, we're going to look at every application that didn't get funded in that first round and has submitted applications by noon on December 15th, and we're going to award another $35 million. Again, if we end up with more applications than funding available, then we'll prioritize and do that. If we if in one of those two rounds, we don't get enough applications, that money just moves to the next round. So 
we don't lose the value of the grant dollars. It's not like it goes away. It just gets lumped into the next round to be made available for additional awards. And then lastly, we'll wrap this up in on December 18th. We'll award the final amount, which is $25 million. And if there were unawarded funds, that'll get lumped into there. And it'll be available to all complete applications that have not yet received awards. So if you if you were part of the first round and you still have not been prioritized, you'll be considered for funding in that third round. So this is the way we ensure that we get the money out as quickly as we can without making it all be on a first come first serve basis. We saw with many other programs, you know, if you didn't have a really fast internet, you might not have had an opportunity to apply fast enough and the money was gone by the time you were able to get in. We don't want that to happen and we don't think that's in New Mexico's best interest. So we've kind of taken the best of both worlds, which has given folks enough time to apply, but also started to move the money as quickly as we can. Again, I can't emphasize enough, please only apply once, um, but apply early. If you, um, if you have the information, don't wait. Apply early. That'll give you the best possible chance at getting funding. Um, and don't try to submit an incomplete application because that will simply slow up your uh, your application. So any application that is received by noon on December 10th is all considered the same time frame. It won't make a difference to us if it's Monday afternoon, Wednesday morning, or Thursday morning. It's all the same time frame. So take your time, but try to meet that first target of noon on December 15th, and that'll maximize your opportunity for funding. <clears throat> the grant itself can be used for regular business expenses that couldn't be paid without the additional assistance provided by the grant. That's ma mainly because you had revenue losses um, as a result of reduced business operations or other reasons. Um, it can also be used for expenses that were incurred during the pandemic, increased expenses such as, you know, um, personal protective equipment, or retrofitting a business to meet COVID safe guidelines. If you had to bring on a new computer system in order to accommodate the changing business environment, that would also be included there. Um, but what we want to do is capture uh, the ways in which businesses um, had actual loss. So we can't base this on projected loss, but actual loss that you saw. We're not going to be asking you to submit receipts but we are going to be asking you to categorize within the application the kinds of expenses you incurred. Um, and these funds are available to all ap eligible applicants. If you've already received funding from either one of the state programs or even the PPP, the federal SBA programs, you're still eligible to apply here. So we are not, we're not requiring you to pick and choose amongst programs. And then lastly, as I mentioned before, we're not going to require you to, to submit documentation with the application, but please remember that these are federal dollars and the state NMFA, we may have to provide documentation back to the federal government about the way the, the monies were spent. So we will, if we're requested by the federal government, we will go back to you for additional documentation. So we're not asking you to submit it up front, but we may be asking you uh, to provide documentation of your expenses later on. So don't make them up. Um, okay, the eligible businesses pursuant to the statute are um, nonprofits that are designated by the IRS as either 501c3s, those will be mostly your charitable organizations, 501c6s, those are primarily um, associations like your chambers of commerce, 501c8s, those are benevolent organizations. And then the legislature also included a broad category of those nonprofit organizations that are designated as some sort of 501c corporation by the IRS that serve um, veterans, past or present members of the U.S. Armed Forces. So any veteran kind of organization, and it could be one of a number of um nonprofits, they're eligible for these funds as well. For for-profit businesses, it can be pretty much any for-profit entity that's um, uh, 
registered to do business in New Mexico. So you're talking about sole proprietors, uh, partnerships, corporations, limited liability companies. The caveat here is that we have to demonstrate that at least 51% of the owners uh, or the ownership is with one or more New Mexico residents. So if you're a sole proprietor, 100%, you have to be a, a, a New Mexico resident. Um, but let's say it's a the limited li company, li limited liability company that has 50-50 um, ownership and 50% of it resides out of state, um, that would not be eligible because you have to have at least 51% ownership by New Mexico residents. And here a New Mexico resident is someone that's domiciled here. These are people that, you know, pay their taxes here, that sort of thing. We're going to evidence it though using a driver's license and we'll need that driver's license for any person that um, makes up that 51% ownership um, and for the person that submitted the application. So we'll we'll need to see verification that you've met the 51% ownership and we'll need to see them by uh, through driver's license. <clears throat> the application process itself, which again opens on Monday, will be using a third-party application uh, site that you'll access through our website. It's nmfinance.com. Um, the, the technology we chose for this is the same one that we used for a program that we operated earlier in the year. That's that Small Business Recovery Loan Fund, and it's called Formstack. And Formstack offers a lot of um, flexibility in the kinds of ways that the questions are asked of you. So it's got some built-in logic to make certain that we're only asking you questions that are relevant for you. Um, and it allows some uh, document processing and allows for everything to really happen within the site. Um, so it's a very easy system to use. It should not take you long should you have all the documents together. And I'll give you a little preview of what that looks like. Um, but some of the things you'll need to have for sure is um, checking accounts. When you when you apply, you'll need to have a checking account from a federally insured financial institution. We're going to be depositing those monies directly into your bank account, and we want to make certain that the receiving entity, the 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 bank that's receiving the funds, has gone through some level of um, verification as to who the owner of the account is so that somebody doesn't try to create a bank account in your name and take monies that should be going to you. So it's really a fraud mitigation uh, tool for us. So you'll need to have a checking account. We're going to actually ask to see um, a copy of a canceled check, or if you don't have that, avoided check so that we can verify that information. Um, We'll also be uh, requiring you to use your email system pretty regularly. Once you've submitted the application, all the documents that you're going to need to submit are submitted as part of the application. We're not going to ask you for things later on. Um, when we have something to tell you, it will happen through email. Um, so if, you are, if you've been selected as a, a grantee, you'll be sent a grant agreement via email. It's basically a link that you'll get. You'll hit the link and go in and um, through a digital signature, execute the grant documents and get them back to us. Something you can even do on your smartphone um, or other uh, device. So that's a very simple, straightforward way to do it. And it should happen very quickly, but you need to be looking out for your emails. And then, as I said earlier, then after the grant documents are signed, we'll be then depositing funds through a direct deposit directly into your bank. We're not sending checks out. Um, and it will be done um, through what we call an automatic, an uh, automated clearinghouse. So it'll take about a day after a day to two days after we get the grant agreement back. During the course of the um, next several years, we will ask you from time to time for information on your business. Um, we want to make sure that we understand the impact of the award. It won't be long or tedious, but we do want to see that you're either still in business or the number of employees you currently have. We'll use this information to report back to policyholders about the benefits of programs like this so that when they're looking at ways to help New Mexico businesses, they'll have really good information about what worked in the past and how beneficial it was. So we want to collect enough information that gives them a good idea as to how to help you in the future. Um, Formstack 
requires that you have all the documents ready to go in an electronic format. The benefit of Formstack is you don't have to have anything like a, an account set up in order to access it. The drawback is you're also not able to go in and save your work as you go. So you can't save it and come back later um, and complete the application. So what you'll need to do is make sure you have the documents in electronic format at the time you start. That includes copies of the um, driver's licenses that we talked about. It'll include a couple of other documents as well. Um, if you aren't able to supply those documents, there'll be a couple of them that you can't even submit it unless you've uploaded a document. But if you've uploaded a document that isn't correct, we're not going to have enough time in this very short time frame to go back with everyone and um, get that corrected. So we need to tell you now that if it's got the wrong documentation, it's going to be considered incomplete. We will absolutely do our best to keep that corrected. But if there's a high volume of applications and a short period of time, we can't set the expectation that we're going to be able to work with everyone. So we, we need to put you on notice that the, that the information needs to be complete at the time you submit it. And again, watch your inbox. Watch, make sure that you've checked your junk folder or your spam filters for emails from one of these two um, sites. It'll be someone from nmfa.net which is us, or formstack.com, which is where the applications come from. So check those for your uh, notices and things. So here's the information you'll need. Um, when you're completing the application itself, you'll need to have what people call a NAICS code, which is the North American Industry Classification Code. It's something um, you can get it from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, and we'll provide a link for you in our frequently asked questions. <clears throat> it's also information you've had to provide at least on your tax forms or your CRS, you know, the Taxation and Revenue Department. You have to supply at some point an industry classification code and we'll need that as well. We're also gonna wanna see your business's revenues and we mean cash receipts and expenses from April 1st through November 30th. And that's to do that um, profit and loss per employee calculation. And we understand that November 30th was just a couple of days ago. So absolutely, if you need to provide preliminary results in order for November in order to complete that, please do so. Um, we want to be able to put you in a position to succeed here. And we understand that you know bookkeeping doesn't happen quickly in some instances. So if you need to provide preliminary results for those, please do that. We're not asking you to submit or upload the actual um, uh, profit and loss statement or any financial statement, but you'll need to have that information available to answer the questions. And we'll want breakouts such as what, what did you spend on payroll during that time period? What did you spend on your cost of goods sold? What did you spend on um, any uh, COVID related expenditures such as PPP or business retrofits? So we want to have some categories here so that we know, um, so we can evidence that you you incurred some loss. The documents you're going to need to have available at the time you sit, sit down to complete the application is your 2019 business federal tax return. If you are a sole proprietor, we really need to see that Schedule C um, that's attached to your personal income tax. We'll need to see a copy of that quarterly wage report uh, that you submitted to Department of Workforce Solutions to evidence the number of employees that you've selected for purposes of your grant calculation. Uh, we'll need your bank account information as well as a copy of that canceled um, or voided check. We want to make sure that um, we didn't have some sort of entry error in when you put in your bank account information. And then lastly, those driver's license or government-issued identification cards for all authorized officers. Those are the folks that are um, authorized to submit the application on behalf of the business, as well as um, all of those New Mexico resident owners that make up that 51%. And then I'm going to uh, send you to our resources, which is, um, I would start with nmfinance.com. That's our website. There's a page there specifically for the um, grant program. That's where you'll access the applications. There's frequently asked questions, a copy of this webinar, a recording of it, 
a link will be posted on that website. It's a very um, easy to use website and we are updating that place first. So all information that we have available will be posted real time as we understand the information. If you have a specific question that's not answered in the in the frequently asked questions um, section, please send us an email at cares at nmfa.net. We have different people tending to that email. And so you can get faster responses by, by sending questions there. And then lastly, should you need to talk to a person and we understand why, we've set up a direct line at um, 505-992-9696. Um, and we are trying to get that those calls coming in to as many people as possible. We are beefing up our staffing as we speak so that those calls can be taken uh, as soon as you have questions. Um, but again, this program is very new to us. It got approved last week and we're going to open it Monday, but um, please be patient a little bit since we're trying to catch up with the pace of um, this endeavor. And with that, I am ready to answer questions, Joanna. I'm going to keep this page up, though, if I can, while we talk so that people can take down the numbers um, and take down the website. And I've put our street address up here, but I should note that our, our offices are closed. Right now, we have just a very few people there. So there's nobody at our physical offices that's able to answer your questions. So um, unfortunately, if you show up to our offices, we're not going to be able to help you. All of those folks are working remotely. So with that, Joanna, should we go to questions? Sure. Thank you so much, Marquita. And thanks for all the great questions. We are getting these through GoToWebinar as well as Facebook and YouTube. And we got your questions when you registered too. So we're going to do our best to get through this. There's, there's a lot, Marquita. So um, <laughs> okay. To the FAQs and um, hopefully address a lot of questions at the same time. So I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Can an out-of-state business apply? Um, I think the short answer to that is no. It has to be owned by at least 51% by New Mexico residents. Okay. And we understand that that impacts a lot of folks and, you know, the legislature had to make a decision about how to best spend a hundred million dollars. And they started by um, starting with New Mexico business owners. Okay. Thank you. Can I apply if I've gotten the PPP or the EIDL funding or even uh, an SB, the, the Small Business Recovery Loan Fund or other CARES grant from my city or county? This is an important question and I appreciate that question. Um, yes, you can absolutely apply. It won't impact your ability to get funding through uh, the relief grant program. Um, so there probably aren't enough sources of funding available for most businesses. So a please apply um, even if you've already received funding from any other program. And, and this one's important. It's different than some of the other loan programs in that it's a grant. You do not have to pay it back. Okay, thank you. And another question that's related to that one is, is this program the same loan that the cities offered businesses in earlier in the year? So it's the same funding source. This is all part of the federal government's CARES stimulus funding that they gave to the states. Um, but this program is different. We've been given different a different framework in which to offer grants. So there's some um, similarities in that it's federal money, and federal money always has some you know some strings attached to it. Uh, but this program is different than those other ones. Okay. Thank you. Does the program give preference to businesses and nonprofits that have not yet received government funding? Um, no, it doesn't. So it doesn't, um, there's no way for us to really prioritize that. We're doing it based on economic impact. Um, and so we, we don't give preference for anything other than geography, hospitality industries, and severe economic impact. Okay, thank you. 
are the application requirements for this program administered by local city uh, or county government or even by the state? So, I don't think I understood that question. Could you ask that again, Joanna? I'm sorry. Sure. I think the question is getting at um, who, I guess if you could, you could repeat again, who is administering this program? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Yes. So, the New Mexico Finance Authority is administering it. We're getting the funding directly from the state to make up to $100 million in grants. So it's, again, a similar funding source, but different program rules and policies, different process. Okay, thank you. And it might be getting at as well, um, if you could shed some light on who um, created the rules or how those rules were created for the program. Yeah, thank you for that question. So, um, since last week, we've been putting together um, policies and procedures to help operate this program. That's the New Mexico Finance Authority. That's the we there. Um, we've we put out a request for public input on how to determine the priorities that were set out in statute. So, how should we determine what? How should we ensure that there's geographic dispersion? Um, how should we give priority to hospitality and industry? How should we determine um, severe economic impact? So we received public input. We also consulted with other agencies, Economic Development Department, Department of Tourism, Workforce Solutions, about uh, program guidelines, things that they thought would be important for prioritization. Um, and the Finance Authority Board of Directors approved our policies and procedures on Tuesday. Um, so again, we are subject to slightly different overall rules on how the money will be spent. The legislature told us um, the basic rules of the program and everything was everything else has been devised by the New Mexico Finance Authority. So our, I guess I should say our application requirements will very likely be different, although there will be some similarities. Okay, thank you. Where do people go who need help applying? Uh, for example, if they have disabilities or they are computer illiterate. So um, my suggestion is that you start with the small business development centers. They are located across the state. They have a, a number of people that have a lot of experience in helping small businesses either find the right resources or you know, help you uh, submit applications. Um, so I, I think that they are always a very good first start for most small businesses. They are, um, they're an incredible resource. And I think that Joanna, at the very beginning, you shared that link for the small business development centers. So that's where I would start for sure. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. If a business doesn't have any employees, does the owner count as one employee? So if the if the business owner is providing um, a wage report to Department of Workforce Solutions, then yes. If they're not, because they're paying themselves basically from the profits of the business rather than a salary, um, then they would count as a non-employer business and be eligible for that two thousand dollars. Okay, thank you. Will the guidelines and application be available in Spanish? Yes, we are doing our best to get everything available in both English and Spanish. Um, again, we are doing this real time, um, so we are. You, you'll have to. Forgive us for a little bit of a delay in getting everything translated over, but we are working to get that done quickly. Thank you. Here's a question uh, that is saying that their their business is uh, at their home address in Corrales, but physically located in Albuquerque. Is that a problem? If there's, do they need to have only one address in the state? So, no, I think um, the way I would phrase that is that a lot of business 
businesses may be physically located in one place, their shop may be at one address, but the headquarters for the business may be someplace else. So if you are, you know, if you are a corporation address is one place, but your the place where you operate a business is another, um, we're going to want to ultimately look at where your business itself is located, not where the corporate ownership is. So we'll be looking at that. So if you if you are one of those instances in which the ownership is separated from the actual physical location of the business, we ultimately will be basing the decision uh, for that rural urban split on where the business itself is located. Great, thank you. Oh, and Joanna, I should say that we have seen some questions come out, and I don't know if it's further in this list. Um, if you are um, a corporation that has maybe three or four different locations. Um, so we'll be basing this basically on the, the federal ID numbers. So if you have different ID numbers for each of those businesses, then you can apply separately. If you don't, then you can only apply the one time. So it's going to be ultimately based on how you report to the IRS and how you report to the Department of Workforce Solutions. You know, so if each of those businesses has its own wage report, then they can you can apply separately for that business. Okay, good point. Thank you. Here's a question from an art gallery. What qualifies as a hospitality and leisure focused business that these grants focus on? Sure. So leisure, again, is going to go back to that um, uh, NAICS code. Um, and it'll start with basically 71s. Um, and that includes arts, entertainment, and recreation. And so I believe, for instance, an art gallery would fall into that leisure category. But your your six-digit code will start with a 7-1 for all of the leisure businesses. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question that is uh, talking about the business is, is very close to having to close. Um, and they are inquiring about how soon will can they expect to receive funds? So that's an excellent question. Again, we're going to be doing these in those rounds, if you will. Um, our goal is to get all the money into the uh, hands of businesses by December 24th, because again, if we haven't put it into businesses by December 28th, the state's going to revert it and send it over to another purpose. So we have to get that money into the business owners' accounts pretty much before um, the holiday break. Um, but if you are funded in the first round, you will obviously receive your funding earlier. So it's not necessarily when you are submitting your application, but it'll be based on when and if you're prioritized for funding. Um, but typically we're saying, you know, five to seven days tops. If you're a third round applicant, you submitted your application on December 17th. Again, our goal is to get that money um, in your hands before December 24th. So five to seven days would be, I think, um, from the point at which we close that round. Okay. Hopefully an early Christmas present. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. We've seen this question a lot uh, from businesses that actually are wanting to start operations. Um, this, this is saying, I want to start a business. Can I receive financial assistance with the CARES Act? No, the federal requirement is that the business um, has been impacted by um, the pandemic or the emergency health orders surrounding the pandemic. So um, if you are just starting your business during the pandemic, we can't evidence that. You weren't impacted by the pandemic if you started in the midst of it. So we're going to need to see, even if you were a new business in January, you'd be fine. We'll need to see that by about March 15th, that you were already starting your business. You, you'd applied for your license, you tried to get your, you know, your, or you did get your um, FEIN number, your federal employee ID number, you know, those steps that you have to take to open a business, we're going to need to see evidence of that if you don't have an actual business tax return from 2019. So you'll, we talked earlier that we need to see a business tax return. Well, if you started in February, um, 
then you would not have one of those. So you'll have a different form that you'll have to fill out. But if you started after the pandemic and after the emergency health order started, you are not eligible for this funding. Okay, thank you. Many questions about that, the time frame, and um, when when the date is that they they could apply. Okay. Yeah, and I, the the basic gauge that we're giving is the you know you needed to have been a, an established business. That doesn't mean that you've collected revenues yet, but we know how much it costs to open a business. Um, so you just needed to have established your business presence um, by the time the pandemic hit. You know, lots of businesses, it takes six six months or more to actually get your business to the point where you've opened it. So as long as you've done those things before the pandemic hit, then uh, you're eligible. Okay, thank you. Do private schools qualify for funding? If they are 501c3, um, then yes. And I think that's the only one that they would be under the, the calculations or the um, eligibility requirements. Okay. And there's a number of these eligibility questions. So I'll just highlight some of the ones that I'm seeing come through. Um, one of those that we're seeing a lot are, are churches eligible? So I do not believe that churches fall under the eligible 501Cs. Um, I don't think that they qualify as C3s, but um, my ignorance aside, a 501C3, a 501C6, a 501C8, or veteran, uh, or they serve the veterans, then they're eligible. If they're not one of those, they're not eligible. Okay, thank you. Another eligibility question, uh, does farming qualify for this grant funding? Um, agricultural businesses qualify for the funding. Okay, thank you. And there's, there's another follow-up question that is related, so I'm just going to highlight that. So if others have the same question, um, and that goes for... I assume these small ranches affected by COVID. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so they'll, you know, again, as long as they are um, filing reports with the IRS about their business income. Um, and again, if they don't have employees that are, are uh, whose wages are reported to the department of workforce solutions, then they'll be considered those non-employer businesses. So those are the important designations to remember. How did you report your activities and income uh, to the IRS? And how did you report your employees to the Department of Workforce Solutions? So those two things are really driving the eligibility and, and how they'll be determined or considered. Okay, thank you. Is this program open to anyone that owns a franchise? Yes, uh, as long as they are, the franchise is owned by at least 51% by a New Mexican, then they are eligible. Okay, and one more question about eligibility. And this is more about uses of the funding. Does this program include, can the, the funding be used for building repairs or purchasing of equipment? Um, yes, as long as the it's COVID related um, or if it was a, you know, planned expense, I would say generally, yes. Um, what we want to see though, is that basically you either incurred revenue losses or that you had additional expenditures related to operating your business in COVID time. So if you've had to retool your physical space, in order to meet, you know, some of the requirements, then then absolutely that kind of business retrofit or at uh, physical space adaptation would qualify. Okay, thanks. Next uh, question is: My business income and expenses go through my personal account, the same account I pay my gross receipts and taxes. Can I still apply? So yes, it sounds like that that person is a sole proprietor. 
And so, yes, they're still able to apply. If they've got a corporation, but they're putting all of their expenses through their personal account, we need to see that the business account is in the, um, that they're, unless they're a sole proprietor, they need to have a business account going, their funds going through a business account. I apologize, that was inarticulate. But your, I think this means checking account, but your checking account really needs to match the business owner. So if the business is a corporation, it should be a corporation on that checking account. Okay, thank you. Do we have to prove a reduction in revenues? No, you could have the same level of revenues, but increased expenses. Um, and you would still have been, you, you'd still show that you were um, impacted negatively by the pandemic. So it could be a reduction in revenues, or it could be an increase in expenses. In most instances, it will be both. Um, but I've, either of those things would qualify you for um, evidences being impacted by um, the pandemic. Other programs require you to show a specific loss, and we're not looking for that. We just have to see that during the course of the pandemic that you have been negatively impacted. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm seeing a question here that's... Um, Pointing out that many of the, the other grant programs related to CARES, you have to show a 25% or higher reduction. So just that's great. You're clarifying that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, do I need to file an unemployment claim? So it sounds like this question may come from one of the self-employed, um, like the non-business, a uh, non-employer uh, business, and no, they do not have to do that in order to qualify um, in that instance. Okay, thank you. How can I create an application that gives the CARES program the best understanding of whether my business would qualify. So the application itself, and I have to give um, a shout out to our operations um, chief, uh, Adam Johnson. He's put together an incredible application where you are pretty much just filling in the blanks or selecting from drop downs. So the most compelling application will come from the most complete application. If you're submitting your tax returns, make sure you get all the pages in there. Um, if you are getting the quarterly report, make sure they match the, the information you've put in the application. Those are the things that will slow you down and will impact your ability to be considered timely. So that's the best thing you can do. The data in the, the um, application itself, you know, again, make sure you're, you're careful in transcribing your Checking account information and your routing information for your bank, those are important things. Um, it's, it's really just attention to detail. Make sure that the information that you're giving us is correct. We're going to be verifying much of it in different ways. So um, please don't rush through it. Take your time in getting it submitted. There is no difference between an application submitted at 2 o'clock on a Monday versus 11 o'clock on a Thursday. For that first round, it's the same thing from us. So take your time. Make sure you get the documentation in the correct format. Make sure you we can read the check that's been provided. Um, that's the best way uh, to put yourself in a in the position to get funded. Great, thank you, Martina. And I'm looking over the questions. We've got some really good ones, but I'm seeing that. We've done a, a pretty decent job of summarizing the majority of them. I know you have uh, your team reviewing the questions as well. I don't know if you want to open it up to them to see if they've got additional questions. They want to so bring I know up. that we, we do have Adam. Adam, you're with us, right? I'm here. Excellent. Um, Adam, is there something else that you think we should um, add 
I'm sure that I wasn't as articulate as I could have been on some of those questions. There were some good questions there. Um, but anything else we should add or anything else you saw in the chat box that we should mention? I've been uh, tracking the chat box and um, I think we've hit on um, a good broad set of questions and a lot of them uh, surrounding very uh, similar themes. There's, there is a consistent one about, and it was touched on, but I will just touch on it one more time about whether or not a business <clears throat> who the owner is uh, the only person working, whether or not that is an employee, and that really does come down to, as Marquita said, whether or not you are actually on payroll and reporting to the Department of Workforce Solutions as an employee. Um, otherwise, um, the uh, business has zero employees for purposes of this program. And and I should say, Joanna, most of those businesses don't report them. They they take the income um, as a as an owner and not as an employee. So they don't typically, most business owners don't typically pay themselves as an employee because it's added expense. Um, but that is the difference between a single employee and um, a non-employer business. Okay, thank you. And I'm seeing a, a question on Facebook, and I, I heard you mention this at a previous uh, presentation that you did. You're a busy woman. Um, and this is getting at what if a business doesn't use checks? Um, this is the question related to submitting a, a canceled check. So I can, I can take that one. Um, <clears throat> the... Uh, uh, Another way that that could be accomplished would be uh, generally businesses that are fully electronic and don't use checks can still request a copy of a direct deposit slip that's um, on their bank's um, official documents. Oftentimes, if you're uh, in the mode of being fully electronic, your bank will offer you somewhere in your online banking function a way to get a direct deposit form, and that should provide the information, and that would be acceptable as well. Okay, thanks. And there is a question um, related to, let me scroll back up here. Um, this had to do uh, with the I-10 numbers. Um, are uh, folks that, that don't have a social security number but have an I-10 number, are they eligible to apply business owners? So um, yes, it's it's going to be based. Social Security is not a um, a key factor. What's key for us is um, the federal employee identification number. So that that is a really key part. So if you have that for your business, then that's that's the important piece. Adam, do you want to add anything there? No, that's accurate. It just has to be, it doesn't have to be on a, a social security number. It just needs to be the federally issued number. So there, there's a substitute for in the event that that's not a social, but we do need the federally issued number for the authorized officer and for the business itself. Okay, thank you. And one final question on, on my end. A, a person on Facebook is asking, uh, do they have to fill out the application all at once in one sitting? And the answer is yes, um, because you cannot save your progress and come back to it later. When you, and it shouldn't take you very long. If you have those documents, my guess is it would take mm, about 10 to 15 minutes. So this isn't a particularly difficult application. Again, you're not, this isn't, there are no essay tests here. So you're going to be filling in blanks. Um, so if you have your financial information, if you've got your documents ready to submit, um, do that in advance. It should not take you very long to actually get the information put into the system. It's relatively brief. The documents that we selected, we selected because we can get important more than one important piece of information off each document. So we are verifying information that you've submitted through those two documents in various ways. Um, so, you know, 
make sure those are complete um, because we'll be looking for different fields for different reasons. And a lot of this just deals with fraud mitigation. We really don't want somebody else pretending to be you to come in and get grant money that you should otherwise be eligible to receive. Thank you for that, Marquita. That sums it up on my end for questions. Do you all have anything you want to add in closing? Um, you know, I would bring people back to our website. Um, that nmfinance.com. There is a page you can link. There's a banner at the top, a sort of a burgundy colored banner that you can link to take you to the grant page. And that's where we're going to keep all this information. That's where you'll find the application itself, where you'll find frequently asked questions. Again, they'll be available in both English and Spanish, hopefully very quickly here. Um, you'll find uh, a link to this webinar recording there. We try to keep everything in one place and make it as, as accessible as possible. So I would really point you there. If there are things that you still have questions about, start you know at either through the email at cares at nmfa.net. And then if we can't get back to you soon enough or you just simply would rather talk to somebody directly and we understand that, please give us a call at 505-992-9696. Uh, um, we have a very limited time in which to get the money out to help as many businesses as possible. We appreciate people's patience. Um, this was a, a, a big lift in a short period of time. So we appreciate people's patience as we kind of uh, deal with a few growing pains here. But I, I think we're in really good shape to open on Monday and to get money out as quickly as possible to you all because I know there's a lot of need out there. Adam, anything we need to add? I would just emphasize one more time to uh, review the FAQs for the, the documents that will be required that will also be posted on the beginning of the application to make sure you have those. Um, as Marquita mentioned, that's going to be likely the more time-consuming part of um, prepping for the application. The application itself um, it should be um, a rather short sit in front of the computer or your iPhone, Android, or tablet of your choice it's compatible compatible with all of those environments uh, lastly i uh, do encourage you to use uh, google chrome firefox or safari as your web browser okay thank you so much marquita thank you so much for this information and for your time i know that you and your staff are working really hard you're really busy i know you're making the circuit and giving a lot of presentations and uh, just working really hard to get the information out. So thank you so much. And I'd also like to thank all of our participants that are viewing this webinar through the, the webinar platform, on YouTube, on Facebook. Thank you all for your questions and comments. We will get those over to the staff at NMFA. And I would like to also encourage everyone to reach out uh, to us and let us know if we can help in any way at New Mexico Economic Development Department. And um, please, if you haven't already, sign up for our news updates to get any information about programs like this one or our other ones that we come across happening in the state or um, across the country during this difficult time. So again, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Joanna. And, and I will mention one more thing. We will send out this presentation to everyone in a PDF, and you will also get a link to the recording. So thank you. Take care.